energy and, and Europe is really uh, uh, the leader in terms of research and science uh, in the world today. I mean, when you look at the staggering numbers of scientists, for instance, I mean, in, uh, we have around 8 million scientists in the world as per the UNESCO and uh, more than 22% uh, of those are in Europe, more than in the US, in China and other parts of the world. And so Europe is really leading in terms of uh, really basic and fundamental knowledge. But you know, I was looking at uh, these great people that you, you had here and I was thinking about other stories that are not as good. Um, I met uh, not long ago a young uh, uh, European that actually found a very good idea and actually decided to go to the US to actually create the product. And I think that's the thing that we have to work. We have to create the conditions in Europe in a world that is digital where you need speed and scale very quick. You need to have the knowledge and then you have to have the scale of actually having all the whole Europe the and you to put it into play. Yes, because what happens today is that because Europe is still 28 different markets, 28 different labor markets, 28 different product markets, it's like you have to have 28 different companies. I'm actually exaggerating, but it's actually one of the big problems in a digital economy. So what we, are, first of all, I think that uh, these people are just amazing. What I really wanted for Europe is that countries understand that before innovation in science you need to have the preconditions and the preconditions is actually not to be in the way of these business people to let them go break down those borders Absolutely. the virtual borders across the European Absolutely. Union and uh, now a lot of the money I spoke there of the 26 billion for climate uh, technologies climate related activities a lot of that is coming from the horizon 2020 budget if I st understand correctly that's a budget of almost 80 billion over seven years one of the world's biggest really in terms of research and science. Uh, the UK takes uh, some uh, pretty much the largest chunk of that. Is the UK then our most innovative country in Europe? Uh, look, first of all, the UK is uh, essential, is uh, really um, uh, the uh, major uh, beneficiary of, uh, of the money because the UK has really uh, amazing scientists, amazing universities and amazing centres. So on Framework Program 7, the UK actually received more than 7 billion of the amount how of 60 billion they, of that How much time. did they pay in though? I, every country puts in, but I think the UK puts less than it takes out. I just don't want to use those kind of numbers and those kind of comparisons because you get much more out uh, than you put. And in the, case the, in the case of the UK, for sure, that you actually uh, take more in terms of, of nominal amount but specifically you take the ability of have a market of 500 million people and have the best scientists with European programs mm -hmm. and really I think that's one thing that actually we should think that without an European program we do not have we will not have the quality of science that we're doing and the UK is a fantastic partner as you have other partners that are extremely good like Germany France all the Nordic countries that actually have really centers of excellence Indeed, and, and the Nordic countries the seem to be some of more our most innovative countries in Europe Absolutely, absolutely. And you see that, I mean, you see that we have this ranking that we do in terms of innovation and we divide in between the top ones, the innovation leaders. And what do you see there? You see Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Germany. Some uh, of the strongest economies as absolutely. well. Absolutely. And the ones that invest the most, uh, basically they all invest more than 3% of their GDP in terms of science and innovation. Because this, when you look globally, on average across the 28 European Union countries, uh, it's 2% of the GDP that gets invested, mm -hmm. far below for the likes of Japan, for example, which is 3.4%. Is that where perhaps the European Union is slipping slightly on a international it's level? It's a question of the private sector uh, most uh, of it, because I think that you have to look at these uh, really uh, targets in terms of public investment and private investment. And what you see, for instance, in the United States is that you have a much bigger chunk of private investment in terms of research. And so you have to attract more private investment for research science and innovation and we Why have to do all more. Why hesitation do you know? Because of exactly uh, the point that I was making before that Orders. the structural reforms that the countries are still very separated okay. and you have it's to have more harmonized uh, countries in terms of the labor market in terms why because investors they have the whole world to go mm. and if they don't really find that the conditions are ideal they go somewhere else and that's why it was very important for President Juncker to launch the so-called 
the Juncker plan, which was basically how can we actually put more investment on the table so we can attract private investors to tag along uh, in this adventure. One thing I have to say, it opened in 2010, I believe, in Budapest. Uh, we haven't spoken that much of it since, though. It's the European version, if you like, of that uh, very famous American MIT uh, Institute for Technology. What's happening there? It's happening a lot of things. The European uh, Innovation uh, and Technology, the European Institute, is basically, as you call it, uh, you were talking about the, the parallel in between the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the European Institute of Technology. But I think that it's really a place where you find research linked from the really the basic and fundamental to the lab and then to the product. And so we, we have a lot of projects, but I would How like to do, uh, I, I, I just, uh, I just let me just kind of do the circle because uh, you touching upon a point and, and, and I know that uh, you, you've been and you're very well prepared in terms of looking at all these instruments. And one of the things that I got at the beginning is that people tell me, but look, you have so many instruments. You have the EIT, you have uh, instruments like fast track to innovation, you have so many instruments and one of the things that I want to is actually to create a way for innovators to know where to knock at our door as Europe and my idea is to have an umbrella on these that I call it's not uh, more costs or more investment it's an idea called the European Innovation Council which is a little bit to get all these instruments together in the same place because all these instruments go along the same lines which is to help innovators to go to the market and we want innovators to come to us and what we have today is that scientists come to us they come to the European Research Council where they have amazing grants to do their amazing job but to innovators they seem or at least it's our feeling that they get confused with all these instruments so i wanted to put the eit also in the perspective of our policy of uh, european innovation openness and inclusiveness exactly. it is a pretty positive note i have to say uh, to end uh, this uh, year we're coming to the end of december uh, mr carlos moidas thanks so much for your time that brings us to the end of this edition of talking europe do stay with us <laughs>